All right, let's get started. So I am recording this lecture um, a little bit before uh, lecture 10. Uh, we have finished our uh, discussion of method of joints uh, and we're going to do one lecture today on method of sections. So I thought it was a good time now that we've covered all of the trust stuff uh, to go ahead and pre-record this lecture on uh, the introduction to deflections. Uh, if you recall, um, we're not going to be having class on Friday due to a college retreat. Um, so uh, this is uh, a good time as any to go ahead and, and, and go through this topic. Let me go through a couple of announcements. Uh, so the attendance grade should be up to date. Uh, in terms of the homework, where we should be right now, uh, if you're watching this on Friday, uh, is that 3.3 is graded, 3.4 will be due. There is no homework due today, uh, or assigned today, I should say. Uh, I'm going to assign homework four on Monday. So today is just sort of a topics video. So there's no, um, you know, uh, big pressure in terms of a, a homework assignment. Um, Monday, we're going to do our trust deflection lecture, like the actual uh, in-class problem. Uh, we'll have a homework on Monday. Uh, we'll do the exam review Wednesday, and then we'll do the exam uh, on Friday. And before I get into this, I guess one thing that's worth mentioning is that this is a, um, uh, a little bit of a math heavy and theory heavy lecture. Uh, I think I've done a, a reasonably good job of trying to simplify it as much as possible. Um, I don't want to uh, uh, do, you know, throw too many equations and formulas at you. So I'm really trying to take it slow. Uh, but I really think it's important to understand this uh, concept of an energy method because we're going to be using it quite a bit, not just with trusses, but with beams and frames later, because we're going to be using this uh, uh, method called the method of virtual work uh, quite a bit. Uh, in order to determine deflection. So with that, let's just go ahead and get started and talk about deformations uh, in structural systems. So, uh, so far, um, what we've been focused on is uh, forces in structural analysis. So we have some system and we're computing the reactions or we have a truss, we're computing the internal um, uh, axial forces inside the members. And when we start with um, uh, Beam, uh, beams and frames, the first thing that we're going to do is uh, uh, learn how to construct shear and moment diagrams, which is essentially a force response. You know, we're looking at the internal forces inside the structure that are required to maintain equilibrium. But now we need to look at the other end, which is uh, looking at deformations. You know, uh, and, and for deformations, what we're talking about ultimately uh, globally throughout the course is uh, both deflections and rotations. So you know, uh, for example, if I have a beam and I take that beam and I bend it, not only does it deflect, i.e. it translates up and down, so here's the beam and it translates, but it also rotates. Like if I take the beam and bend it, there's, you know, a section that, that changed, you know, its orientation. Uh, so we're going to be uh, focused on looking at, uh, ultimately in this course, course, both deflections and rotations. But for trusses, all we care about are deflections because we just assume that the, uh, the joints deflect and then uh, because there's no moments that, that uh, we don't really need to consider uh, any rotations. Understanding deformations uh, is very, very important uh, in structural engineering for a, a couple of reasons. One, um, just on the face of it, we typically have some sort of limit uh, in regards to deflections or rotations that our, our designs have to satisfy. If we have, you know, uh, I'm, I'm here in my office right now and so not only am I on you know, an upper floor in the building, so I'm, uh, my office is sitting on floor beams, but there's floor beams right above here. Uh, and so one of the things we might want as a structural engineer is to select a, let's say a beam, what have you, that doesn't deflect a certain amount. So common deflection limits in building designs are usually, like for example, like L over 360 or L over 240, usually it's L over some uh, value. L over 360 is a very, very common one for, for building, uh, for, for uh, floor beams. So what we might do is we might say, okay, um, you know, here's a beam. It's going to be 30 foot long. So take 30 divided by 360, um, which uh, comes out to one inch and say, okay, I need to select a beam such that it doesn't deflect more than one inch. So obviously we need to be able to compute deflections in order to be able to design beams to meet those types of limits. So that's one thing. Um, and another thing is indeterminate analysis. Um, We've been focusing on statically determinate structures and you can't analyze indeterminate structures without being able to analyze determinate ones. I mean, just because of the complexity of the problem. But 
Um, the other thing is, once you understand how to uh, analyze determinant structures, the way that you analyze an indeterminate structure is you have to understand the relationship between the applied loads and the resulting deformations. Uh, so for example, um, and I'm referring a lot just here to beams because I have my little beam uh, prop here, but we're going to be doing our deflection start, uh, starting off with trusses, but the theory is the same. So if I have a, a simply supported beam, that's statically determinate. But if I throw another support in the middle, then it becomes indeterminate. And so one of the ways that we can analyze that beam is we recognize that the deflection here is zero. So a common indeterminate analysis method is we will let the beam deflect, you know, I don't know, whatever the deflection is, let's say it's two and a half inches, and then we'll ask what is the upward force required to push it back up two and a half inches? And whatever that upward force is, that's the reaction at the pier. So you can't do that if you don't understand how to compute deflection. So it's an incredibly important task uh, for a structural engineer. Now, like I said, we're gonna be talking about trusses to start off because that's what we've been focusing on. So let's look at an illustrative example for truss deflections. So let's take a look at this truss, okay? Now off on the face of it, you should recognize that we have, we've done this truss before. This was actually the very first truss deflection problem uh, that we did, uh, or sorry, truss analysis problem that we did, the first method of joints problem. There's a little bit of additional information, but this is the same truss that we did uh, in our first example. I think this was uh, lecture um, seven, I think it might have been. Uh, anyways, uh, so let me turn my laser pointer off here. Okay, so what we're going to do here is uh, I'm, I've assigned a task to determine the vertical deflection at B, okay? So in other words, I'm gonna turn my laser pointer back on. So here is our truss and I wanna determine this vertical deflection. So just so that we're all uh, uh, conceptualizing the problem, when we apply these loads, just like we apply the loads to any structure, if I have a beam and I put load here, it's going to deform. The idea is how much does it deflect? How much does it translate? So I'm guessing just based on the loading on this uh, truss that it's going to deflect downward. So the idea is, okay, here's joint B. After I apply these loads, um, it's going to probably deflect downwards. And so the idea is what is this deflection? We'll call it delta BY. What is that deflection? That's the goal, okay? Now, um, one of the things that you should notice right off the bat is that in addition to the just truss itself, we've got the truss, the members, the loads, we've also been given some additional area or some additional uh, information for each uh, member and that, uh, that is the area. So for each member you can see there's an area provided. Uh, and not only am I gonna tell you that, but I'm also gonna tell you about, uh, one more fact about this truss, and we'll assume that this truss is made out of, and I just made this up for the purposes of this problem. Let's just say it's made out of aluminum. So um, I'm telling you information, not just about the truss in general, but its constitutive properties. What material is it made out of, and uh, essentially how big around each of those members are. And those are critical pieces of information for a, um, uh, for a deflection or for a deformations problem that you wouldn't need for forces or force analysis in a statically determinate structure. You know, if you have a simply supported beam uh, and I put, and here I go back to the beam again, if I have sim a simply supported structure, let's just say, and I put 50 pounds in the middle, the reactions are 25 pounds a piece. It doesn't matter if the beam is made out of steel, concrete, wood, it doesn't matter. The, if you put 50 pounds in the middle of a simply supported structure, then the reactions are 25 pounds a piece. The forces don't change uh, dependent upon the constituent properties, but the deflections do. If I put 50 pounds in the middle of a beam, it's gonna deflect. How much uh, it deflects depends on whether or not it's steel, concrete, popsicle sticks, what have you. So we need to know that information, or at a minimum, uh, that information has to be part of the problem. Either you're given um, the constitutive properties of the structure and you need to determine the deflections or um, maybe it's on the design side. What do the constitutive properties need to be in order to satisfy some deflection limit? Um, so they, long story short, they're gonna have to be part of the problem. And so for trusses, because we're only considering axial deformation, the only thing we really need are the Young's modulus or the elastic modulus of the material. And so we'll assume all of these members are made out of aluminum. And so the Young's modulus, the E value for aluminum is about 10,000 KSI. And we also need the cross-sectional area um, because it, think if you go back to just axial stress, sigma equals P over A. So we need the area and we need the E value. Um, 
each member could have a different A value, each member could have a different E value. You could have one member be aluminum and one member be steel. Not very common uh, in applications, but just so you get the idea. Um, and so again, our goal is to determine the vertical deflection at B. Now, what I want to do is I want to show you first what we do in the method of virtual work. So what you're gonna see on this slide is sort of what you do after the derivation. So my thoughts are I'm gonna show you what you do then I'm gonna explain why you do it, and then we'll do it again in a little bit more detail. So if some of the theory and whatnot kind of goes over your head, I, I think it'll, it'll be okay. You can obviously rewatch, but I want you to rest assured that the actual method uh, is pretty simple. So step one is to analyze the truss, okay? So we're gonna analyze the truss, uh, and first off, you should, recognize, um, you should recognize these forces, because again, we did this uh, example in class. So these uh, forces here, we, we, we came up with these uh, already, okay? And so we call that the real analysis, and we call it the real analysis because those are the real loads that are on the structure, okay? So that's step one. Step two is you take all of those loads off of the structure, so the 10 kips, the 15 kips, 20 kips, all those loads, take them off, and then you do this. So step two is what I'm calling the virtual analysis, and it's the virtual analysis for the vertical deflection at B. Remember, the goal of this problem is to determine the deflection at B, the vertical deflection at B. So I place a single load at B, okay? I place it at B because that's where I want to find deflection. If I, wanted to, if I told you I wanted to find deflection at E, I'd put the load at E. Uh, I'm placing it downward because I want vertical deflection, and I'm assuming it's, it's going to deflect downward. Um, and it is one for a very specific reason. We'll talk about that uh, later as to why the value is one. But you always place a one load. You think about it as like one kip or one kilonewton. Really, it's just one. It's a unitless load. Uh, but you can think of it as like one kip. So we place this unit load at B going downward. And then we analyze the truss again. So one, I guess one of the things that is a little hampering is that you have to do two truss analyses. One for the real loads and one for the virtual load. And if you'll notice, I kind of named them differently. I've got big F's for the real loads, uh, uh, the real results, and then little F's uh, for the virtual results. And so for each member, you're going to have a real force and a virtual force, a big F and a little F. Um, each member also has certain properties. It has a length, it has an E value, an A value. And so for each one of those members, you compute the following term, little F times big F times L divided by EA, and you just sum it up. And so this is a very tabular calculation, works really well with Excel, um, just plug and chug. And then when it's all said and done, the sum at the bottom, that's your deflection. And so I'm gonna explain here in a bit why that worked, but um, we're gonna be talking a lot about energy and energy components. And so there's gonna be a lot of graphs and, and alphabet soup. And so just stay with me that ultimately the method is very simple. Now, one thing I can't answer right now is the, if you actually take all of these values in this table and sum them, you get a positive number. And so what that positive number means is that if you look in step two, we assumed a downward load. If you get a positive value, then that means our assumption was correct and it does in, uh, in fact deflect downward. If not, that just means you assumed the incorrect direction and it is in fact deflecting upwards. So we assume the correct direction and the sum ends up being about 0.237. So that means that delta by is 0.237 inches downward. And that's it, that's, that's the method. It's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Now I wanna explain why we did what we just did. And in order to do that, I have to first start talking about energy. Um, we're gonna be talking about um, this approach from the concept of energy because that's really what this is. This is an energy method. Energy method might seem a little uh, wild or a little bit of a, um, a tough idea to understand, but just about everybody uh, in this class, I don't say just about, I say everybody in this class uh, has utilized an energy method at one point in order to solve a problem. So let's talk about what I mean, okay? So let's go back to basic physics, the law of conservation of energy, which states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be converted from, uh, to different forms. Everybody uh, in, in this class is, should be familiar with that concept. And again, you've used energy methods uh, to solve problems. Let me give you a, a humorous example. So here's a screenshot from a um, uh, you know, new Super Mario Brothers uh, video game. Um, here we've got this uh, Goomba right here. Okay, the Goomba has some mass M and the Goomba is sitting here on this little perch, okay? And let's say this perch 
has some height h, okay? So while the Goomba is sitting on top of the perch, the Goomba has a stored gravitational potential energy of mgh, the Goomba's mass times the gravity times its height. Once this Goomba steps off this ledge, that potential energy does not get destroyed, it gets converted into kinetic energy. And then at the bottom, you know, let's say here's the Goomba right here, once the Goomba's at the bottom, uh, all of that potential energy has been converted into kinetic energy, and so that kinetic energy will equal one half mv squared. And so you can use the fact that uh, energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be converted, um, you can use this to determine, okay, what is the velocity at the bottom of the fall? This is an energy method, recognizing that energy cannot be created or destroyed to, dissol to solve a problem in physics. Everybody in here has done a, a, a problem like this. So this is what I mean by uh, an energy method. Um, what I want to focus on is energy methods that would be applicable to structural engineers. Okay, And I'm going to throw another video game example at you, and we're going to show you this image of Link. So I have here, uh, and I was reaching for this a second ago, I have here a rubber band, and I have here a few folded uh, bits of paper. And so how, do, how does this work if you wanted to shoot this uh, uh, bit of paper? So take the bit of paper, put it in the rubber band, and then let's see what you do, okay? Uh, let's look at this, this example. So what I'm going to do is take this structure, I'm going to deform it, okay? Now what I propose that you're doing is by deforming it, you are storing energy in the rubber band, just like Link stores energy in the bow when Link draws the bow in order to shoot an arrow, okay? Because when I let this go, boom, it flies, okay? And there are some very um, common sense uh, conclusions that you can make to this. For example, if I take this piece of paper and I just give it a little pull, you know, if I just take it and pull it just a little bit, it doesn't fly very far. But if I take this, um, this uh, uh, piece of paper and I pull it really far, boom, it goes, it goes pretty far. So the idea is that the more load that you apply to the system, the more energy it stores, but also the more load that you apply to the system, the more it deforms, right? The goal in this problem, if we're looking at the, uh, the structural engineering equivalent is here's the, the, the structure, the piece of paper is the load, the load deforms the structure. I want to know what that deformation is. I want to know what that distance is, what that deformation is. And what I'm going to do is use an energy principle that the energy that's put in must equal the energy that's stored inside the system. So this is going to be the concept that we utilize in order to uh, solve for structural deflections. So our primary focus is going to be on two energy components. Um, the first is going to be what I'm calling the external work done. And so this is going to be the product of forces and distance. This is probably what you're thinking of from physics in terms of work, like force times distance equals work, right? Uh, and so it'll either be the product of forces and distances, or when we get to beams, it'll be the product of moments and rotations, right? So that'll be the external work done. So the analogy for the rubber band is here's the load. Let me put this back on my finger. Here's the load and it's the piece of paper is the force going through you know, some distance. That's the work done. The stored energy would be the stored energy in the structure from axial loads, the stored energy from bending moment, uh, et cetera. So the idea there is you know, when I take a, uh, a structure and I deform it, I mean, you can feel it in your hand if you have like a rubber band and you yank on it, the rubber band gets taut. It's storing that energy. That's why when I let this go, the rubber, the, the piece of paper flies. The, the rubber band is storing the energy that we do to the system, right? The more you yank back, the more energy stored inside the rubber band, the more it wants to fly, okay? So the idea is if we can compute that stored energy and set it equal to the external work done, we can solve for the deformation. And so that's what we do. For all the scenarios, we say that W equals U, uh, energy cannot be created or destroyed, and then we solve. Now, a couple notes before we move on. We're gonna consider all of the problems linear and elastic. So, you know, our stress strain curves are just gonna be linear and our, our curves are gonna be linear. That's gonna make the math a lot easier. Um, also, I mean, that's practical from a real world aspect. We try and keep our, our structures in the elastic range whenever possible. We don't wanna deal with permanent deformations unless we have to. Um, and the other thing worth mentioning is 
we can probably consider other types of structural response like torsion or stuff like that but we're going to try and neglect these especially for trusses uh, for trusses all we're going to consider uh, is axial response so let's talk about axial response let's take a bar and we're going to start simple we're going to start with a simple bar uh, and we're going to take this bar and we're going to um, stretch it some amount delta so kind of analogous to the rubber band analogy so we take some load p apply it to a bar the bar stretches some amount delta so <clears throat> the first thing i want to do is i want to go back to that example with the rubber band i ran out of pieces of paper because i shot them across my office but um, i want to go back to that uh, statement i mentioned earlier that if you take the rubber band and you pull it a little bit you get a little bit of energy but if you yank it a lot you get a lot of energy so the more that you yank it the more it deflects but if we're looking at it from an energy perspective or from the work done the more that you yank the more energy uh, gets stored so really when we're talking about the external work done we're talking about this curve and we're talking about the area under the curve okay so if the load was applied gradually which is what we do in structures we have the beam we put the load on it uh, if the load's applied gradually, then the total amount of external work done would be the area under that curve. And so there's another benefit of assuming everything's linear. We don't have to break out any calculus or anything. The area is just one half P times delta. So the applied load resulting displacement delta, one half equals P times delta, that's your external work done. So what about the stored energy? Which by the way, I, 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 didn't, uh, I didn't go through this in too much detail in the previous slide, but I'm gonna try and keep a consistent color scheme. So my blues uh, represent all the external work done and my sort of burnt oranges represent all of the stored energy. So let me go back to this. Okay, so let's look at the stored uh, energy. Now, we're gonna break back uh, some formulas in engineering 216. So from mechanics of deformable bodies, we know that, okay, you have sigma equals F over A. You have Hooke's law, right? So sigma equals E times the strain. Uh, and then uh, what is strain? It's the change in length over the original length. So if you have something like, uh, let's see, I don't know, maybe we'll put it like right here. So sigma equals E times strain. We'll take this and call it F over A. Call this delta over L. And then just solve for delta, you're gonna get delta equals FL over EA, right? Just divide both sides by E, multiply both sides by L. Uh, and that's exactly what you get right here. Just take that and solve. Pretty straightforward. I, I, I don't think there's anything um, <clears throat> too terribly complicated uh, about that. So from a stored energy perspective, what I'm proposing is that you're getting the same but instead of just this being, you know, delta, uh, instead it's the stored energy inside each bar, which is um, uh, FL over EA. So the area of this curve is one half base times height, one half of, you know, FL over EA times F, uh, and then you get this. Now, one thing that might be a little confusing is that in this slide, I've got a bunch of Fs, but in, this slide here i've got p and so some of you might be thinking wait a minute why why did he change the letter why did it go from f to p what's going on there okay well for a single bar it's pretty obvious that f equals p right if i have a bar and i push on it with some load p or if i yank on it with some load p let's say the load the axial load that you apply to it is p the internal load that it's storing is p like i mean there's just one bar that's simple the reason for the different load or the different letters is because of truss analysis, right? If you have, I mean, let's just go back a few slides to just some of the. So if you have a truss and you put, you know, a single load on that truss, it doesn't mean that all of the bars have the same load. Like you can put 20 kips on a member and you might, or on a joint, and you might get 50 kips in this member and 30 kips in that member and 10 kips over here. So the, the, the point I wanted to do was I wanted to differentiate that there is a difference between the external load that you apply to the system and the internal load that's stored inside each member. Okay, uh, for a single bar, it's obvious. So that's why there's two different letters there. Okay, so let's just summarize so far. So using the law of conservation of energy, we focus on two sources, the external work done and the stored strain energy. And so what we do is we set those terms equal to one another. 
uh, and you know there we go we can solve for the displacement now <clears throat> again if you have a single bar for a single bar we know that just F is gonna be P right so we can call this P squared L over 2 E A set that equal to one half P Delta right and so what do we find we find the twos cancel we find the P's cancel and we get Delta is PL over EA what well, exactly what we, we knew from the beginning right so so that obviously that makes sense right um, and to be clear energy method I would not use an energy method for a single bar that would be incredibly overkill um, that would not make any sense um, the value of the energy method is for a system of members not for a single member for a bunch of members because the external work done can still be one half P Delta and then the stored energy is just the U value for all the members F squared L over 2 EA okay so the the value of an energy method is it'll allow for us for solve for deflections at a given point but there's a problem with this formulation and the problem is we need a load at the point in question okay and so this sounds like a great idea in theory right now but we have to adjust this method um, because we have an issue that we need to resolve um, and so in, in order to resolve this issue, we're going to introduce a concept of a virtual load. But let's talk about the issue that we need to resolve. The issue that we need to resolve is the formulation of one half P delta, okay? Um, so you, you can compute the stored energy in each member and set that equal to this and solve for delta. But the problem is you can only solve for deflection where the load is applied because the work is one half P delta and so the work is a function of the load and where it's applied. So you wouldn't be you wouldn't be able to solve for the deflection anywhere else in the truss. So if I found, if I've got a truss and I've got a load here, what if I want the deflection over here? Okay, this expression won't work, and it definitely won't work if you wouldn't be able to uh, you wouldn't be able to isolate a single deflection if you had a situation where you had multiple loads applied all at once. So if you had a truss uh, like the one we had in the previous slide what which load do you use Do you use the 10 kips the 15 kips 20 kips like like how do you do that you know um how do you isolate the one that you're looking at that's a very common application you do have trusses with multiple loads on it so again uh, energy method our energy method so far works great as long as we had a truss that only had a single load on it and we wanted to find the deflection at that load in the direction of that load otherwise our method doesn't work so how do we get around this well, our energy expression only works where there is a load applied. And if we are thinking to ourselves, we want deflection at a particular point of interest to handle this, we're going to put a load there. Okay. So the idea is if our energy ex uh, uh, expression only works at the point where a load is applied, we will place a load anywhere we want to find deflection. So if you go back to the method that I showed you earlier, when we had the uh, when we wanted to find the deflection at B we put a load at B and so that's what we're gonna do so to handle this we're gonna place a load at the point of interest so we're gonna have a structure with two sets of loads and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call this P1 and P2 P1 is gonna be the structure with the single load applied at the point of interest and P2 is gonna be the structure with the original loads and ultimately what we're gonna be able to do is we're gonna have a clever way of quantifying the energy uh, and so we're going to be able to lump all of the uh, original loads into a single analysis. And so that's going to lead to what we did before, like the real loads and the virtual loads. So what happens when you apply two loads to uh, a given structure? Let's go back to the original bar and let's flush things out a bit. So I have a bar here and by P1. Uh, and so the, the bar will stretch some amount, we'll call that delta 1. Then I'm going to apply P2. So before I had just P1, now I'm going to put P2 on top of it. Okay, And so the bar will uh, stretch some amount corresponding. So stage 1, we have just P1. And so the total deflection is delta 1 plus delta 2. Okay, None of this seems a little convoluted, but you'll, you'll see what I'm doing here in a bit. Now the ultimate goal is to solve for D2. If you remember, I'm going to go back to my previous slide here. P2 is the structure with the original loads. P1 is the uh, 
load with the single or the structure with the single load applied at the point of interest. So P1 is what we're going to call our virtual load. It's a fictitious load. Think of it as just like a marker that we're placing on the structure in order to track the energy. P1 and delta 1 are fictitious. They don't really exist. What I really care about is delta 2. Okay. So I really want you for the next few slides, the one thing I want you to burn in your head is the only thing you care about is delta 2. Okay. So let's look at the external work done. Okay. So the first thing that we do is we apply that P1 and the structure responds by deforming some amount delta 1. Then we apply some amount P2 and the structure responds by deflecting some additional amount delta 2. So if you look at your load deflection curve, it's now got some different regions. And so if you notice here, I've called this W1, W2, W3, just so that we're you know, referencing something that's common. And so what I can now say is that the external work done is now the sum of these three regions. So uh, W1 is 1 half P1 delta 1, W3 is 1 half P2 delta 2, and then this W2 is just P1 times delta 2. So what I've tried to do here on this image is make sure that all the um, dimensions are placed and labeled appropriately so you can kind of see what I'm doing here. Now, that's the external work done. What about the stored energy? So it's a similar process. So um, I'm going to use some notation here. Remember, I, I split up between um, big Fs or, or big Fs and little Fs before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the little Fs are generated by that P1, that, that marker load, that it's sort of that tracking load on there that doesn't really exist. It's just a tracker that I'm using to store the energy. So that's why the little Fs, they're virtual, they're real, they don't really matter uh, in terms of the real life forces on structure. So little F is the internal force generated by P1, big F is the internal force generated by P2. So similarly, we're gonna have little f develop inside each member. They're going to respond by deforming little f L over EA. And then you apply the second load. Each member is going to uh, respond by developing an internal force big F. Uh, and so it's going to respond by de uh, deflecting an additional big F L over EA. So I do the same thing. U equals U1 plus U2 plus U3. And I just do all the alphabet soup to simplify each member. And so I have, and if you notice, that term should be kind of familiar because I showed you that at the very beginning. That is U2, okay? So um, now I have these expressions for the external work done and the stored strain energy, okay? What am I gonna do with these? It's a lot of alphabet soup. <clears throat> so let's just summarize. First off, the external work done. Okay, so we have each of the three regions and we're summing those regions up. And so these are the expressions. So W1 plus W2 plus W3 and that's what I found in those previous slides. Stored energy. Again, each member responds by stretching some amount. And so U1, U2, U3, here's all the stored energies. It seems nuts, okay? But let's go back to our Law of conservation of energy. Law of conservation of energy says that energy cannot be created or destroyed. So W equals U, okay? But here's the kicker, okay? Here's what the cleverness is. The cleverness is not just that W equals U, but each of these regions are also equal to. So W1 equals U1. W2 equals U2. W3 equals U3, okay? So each of these regions all uh, equal one another respectively. And so what I'm going to do is instead of looking at all three, I'm only going to look at one comparison, okay? And specifically the comparison I'm going to look at is the W2s and the U2s. And there is a reason why, okay? Because if you compare W2 to U2, you get this expression right here. And this is an incredibly, incredibly important expression, okay? Because let's just take a second and, and digest what's going on in here. So first off, let's look at the left side. We've got our P1, which is the external load that we applied, and we've got delta 2, which is the deflection that we wanted, okay? So it's isolating delta 2. We only care about delta 2, okay? But we're also using both the responses of little f, 
big F, L over EA, we're also using P1. So we're using everything that we need and we're isolating delta two. Look what we've got here on the right, little f, big F, L over EA. And we've got our separate, our terms little f and big F separated. So the idea is that on the right, we can treat each of those two analyses separately. We can do the big F analysis to get some answers and do the little f analysis to get So all we have to do is plug into this expression and we can solve for delta two. But here, here's the final kicker, okay? Remember, P1 is that marker load. That's that tracking load. It's, it's, it's fictitious. It wasn't really on the structure. We just put that load on the structure so we could track the energy at that. Because we're ultimately solving for delta two, we're gonna divide both sides by P1. So P1 could be any magnitude that we want it to be. It could be 87 kips, it could be 942 kips, it could be 0 0.7 kips. But look at the equation, okay? If you could pick any value that you wanted to for P1, what would Well, anything times one is itself. So why try and make it complicated? Just use one. And so if you go back before, I said, when you do the virtual analysis, you place a single unit load, that's a value of one. This is why you use the value of one, because if I use the value of one, I can solve for my known deflection. And that's the method of virtual work. So now let's go back to that example I discussed earlier. And I just said, okay, here's just what you do. Now let's do it in a little bit more detail. So the method of virtual work also known as the unit load method because you play, place a unit load. It's an energy-based approach to computing deflections. And the value of it is that the method of virtual works, uh, virtual work works for any structure subjected to any type of loading. And so let me explain what I mean by that. Um, if you open your textbook, your textbook is discretized into two chapters on deflections. And one of them is on geometric methods and one is on energy methods. Um, geometric methods only work for beams and frames and to be clear there are some advantages to using some geometric approaches sometimes when you have problems that have particular geometry or particular types of loading sometimes geometric math uh, methods are a little bit faster for beams and frames but uh, energy methods like the method of virtual work will work for any structure subjected to any type of loading so I tend to focus on it, on it a lot because you only have to remember one method and it will work all the time. It's the most universally applicable. And for trusses, there is only uh, an energy method. You really don't have geometric methods that would work for trusses. We can really only use uh, an energy method. Uh, so for trusses, it's the only way to go. And for beams and frames, it is one heck of a powerful way to go, which is why we focus on it a lot uh, in here. So if we go back to our illustrative example, again, if we go back to some of these formulas that we had here, we had E's and A's, so we're gonna need the E and A for each of these uh, members. So that's why you've got the A value for each member and you've got the E value for each member. Another term that we'll need is the length of each member, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that uh, here in a bit. Um, but so how's this gonna work? So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna determine the real internal forces, uh, and we'll call those capital F. So that goes back to uh, what I had mentioned earlier. And it'll be relevant in a bit because we're gonna use those terms in that expression that we saw earlier. So this is after you solve the truss, you can see that each member uh, is labeled compression or tension uh, with capital F. Um, then what we do is we apply a virtual load, okay? Uh, recall that in the discussion, if we set P1 equal to one, it's the easiest case. That's why we use a value of one. We put it at B because that's our marker for tracking the energy. So that's why we put it at B because we want to be able to compute the external work at B because our goal in this problem is to find the vertical deflection at B. We place it downward because based on the original structure, I think it's deflecting downward. And if it's deflecting upwards, I think you can probably guess what's going to happen, but it's not the end of the day. You can pick a direction and if you get uh, your assumption incorrect, it's pretty easy to figure out. It has a magnitude of one and an assumed direction. We determine our internal forces, we, so we analyze the truss again, and we denote those with a lowercase f, again, because we, um, we plug those into the formula that we're gonna see. So technically, from a unit's perspective, these have no units, and I'm gonna talk about the units in a little bit more detail here in a second. 
But one thing to keep in mind is, and I know this kind of sucks, but um, you do have to analyze the trust twice to do the uh, method of virtual work. But when you do it the second time for the virtual load, you have a trust and you're only placing a single load on it. So um, you do have to solve the trust twice. I know that sucks, but there's always some tricks that you can employ. For example, this trust is symmetric. So you really only have to analyze the left half and then mirror the results. Um, while it wasn't applicable for this trust, you might have a trust with some zero force members that can make your life a little easier. Uh, so make sure that you're trying to pull all the tricks out of your bag to, to make the analysis uh, as easy as possible. So now let's go back to the method. So we have two sets of results. We have big F and we have little f. Now I kind of want to focus on the units right now because big F is in kips little f is unitless there are no units okay so if we go back to our previous formulas we're going to use little f times big f times l over ea right so little f is unitless big f is in kips what about e e is a modulus of elasticity or young's modulus and so that's usually expressed in ksi kips per square inch uh, and then the a value is the area of each member and that's expressed in square inches so follow this along we've got F is in kips, little f is unitless, the modulus of elasticity is KSI, the area is in square inches, and then we have the length of each member. What units do you think we should use for the length of each member? And you guessed it, inches, not feet, okay? So whenever you're doing the method of virtual work, make sure that you're using inches for your lengths, okay? So because we're gonna be doing this little f big f l over ea over and over again for every member it's really customary to set this up in a table so what i've got here is i've got uh, this table set up i've got the G the material and the geometric properties for each member uh, already listed uh, and then over here in these next two columns what i'm going to do is i'm going to place the little f and the big f values so all that was was just me going to the trust and writing all those values down now it's customary to record the tensile forces as positive. I mean, you have to pick a sign convention, either tension's positive or compression's positive. Customarily, we record tension as positive. Honestly, it doesn't matter. If you wanna record compression positive, that's fine. You just gotta be consistent. So if your little f assumes tension positive, then your big F has to assume tension positive. Because the idea is that when you compute the energy, you want the assumptions to be consistent. Speaking of, little f, times big F times L over EA for each member. So for instance, if you just do it yourself for the first row, take 0 0.0375 times 24.675 times 144 divided by 10,000 times four. And if you do that, you'll get this plus 0 0.0329. So this is a very tabular computation. Wouldn't Excel be really useful here? So we'll probably pull out Excel during our in-class example to show you how simple it is. Now, notice what happens is that each row yields a positive value. So even the members that are in compression, like member DE, right? This is negative, but this is negative too, right? So negative times a negative is a positive. So what will happen when you do this method is that more often than not, they'll either all be positive or they'll all be negative. Um, the only time that they would ever switch signs is either if you had zero deflection, which is pretty rare, um, or you screwed something up. <laughs> so if they're switching signs, there's a good chance that you screwed something up in your analysis. But in my case, they're all positive. And what that means is that we analyzed the structure virtually, we placed a downward load, which means we were assuming it was de deflecting downward. When we got positive values, that means, guess what? It is deflecting downward. So our deflection on that column up and you got 0 0.237 at the bottom, which means that our deflection is 0 0.237 inches downward. And that's how you do it. Um, and hopefully the past few slides explained not just the method, but the, uh, the, the madness behind the method, if you will, the, the, um, the concept. I know there was a lot of alphabet soup there, but again, all we're trying to do is quantify the energy and figure out how much energy the system is storing and how does that compare to the external work done. And the, since the external work done is a function of the deflection, we isolate that and solve for the deflection.
And that's it. That's all I've got for, for the lecture. So on Monday, what we're going to do is we're going to um, go through an in-class example, a pretty comprehensive in-class example, where we compute the deflection of a truss. And, I, and uh, I have an example, but I think what I'm going to do is now that we've done this, I might uh, expand it a bit so that we can cover a few more additional things because I'd like to potentially do both vertical deflection and horizontal deflection uh, of a truss because you'll find in a lot of those instances there's especially I think my, my experience has been with horizontal deflection you can definitely see a lot of zero force members uh, show up. All right that's all I've got I will see you all on Monday.